flip this thing on because it's getting ready to be on. Hello and welcome to Bell Ringer. My name is Greg. Your guest name today is Frank Ewan, the CEO of AML Right Source, a firm specializing in anti-money laundering. Frank and AML expand to Buffalo in March of 2019, and Vest Buffalo Niagara helped with the project at that time. They promised to create 100 jobs in their first five years. Here we are two years later. They've well surpassed that goal and are expanding yet again now into Seneca One Tower. Thanks so much to Frank for his time and you for listening. All right, Frank, thank you very much for being with us again back on Bell Ringer. Appreciate your time. Thanks, man. Nice to be back. So for those that don't know or, or didn't hear our first episode, just quickly, what is AML Right Source? Uh, AML Right Source is the largest global tech enabled provider of financial crime managed services to both banks and non bank financial institutions around the globe. What does that really mean? Uh, it means that we have both uh, consulting um, people and technology um, to solve the, the issue of financial crime for our, for our clients. Um, and really what that means is we've got an army of uh, investigators, analysts, and tools um, to help us really determine and suss out uh, whether there's potentially nefarious activities from a financial perspective happening uh, in and amongst our clients. And since we last talked, I think the company and some of your messaging too publicly has transitioned from uh, the service side of a business and a company. And now, you know, being more of a tech enabled company and adding on those services and that type of talent. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what that means to you and that transition as AML continues to grow. Sure. I mean, well, like many industries um, in financial crime is, is no different. Uh, you know, technology is a huge, you know, uh, enabler and disruptor. Um, and, and I think what we always, at least what I always kind of premised was that you know, if you have deep relationships with, with clients, um, you can use human capital essentially as the tip of the spear to grow trusted relationships. Because if they know you can execute, um, if you've come in, if, if the patient is on the table and they've got an open wound and you're the person who can help um, close that open wound, that patient is going to be more likely to trust you to actually maybe cure their, their disease. And so our theory of the case, my theory of the case has always been if you can get in with, with human capital. Um, it's going to be much easier to land and expand into other service areas. And, and so, um, you know, the way we look at the, the challenge or the problem of financial crime, and, and maybe I should just go back and say, I think I might have said this on the other pod that, you know, if, if you measured uh, financial crime as a metric of GDP, it would be the world's fifth largest economy, just, just to put that in perspective. So, so the problem is very real and acute. Um, and, and if you look across the, the challenge that financial institutions and non-bank financial institutions, and again, when I say non-bank financial institutions, I mean payments companies, fintech, those type of people, money transmitters, casinos. Um, if, if you look across the, the, the challenge that, that they have, it's really threefold, right? Um, they have a challenge in kind of onboarding customers and, and risk associated with that. Um, they have a challenge with maintenance, so making sure uh, that their customers aren't on any sanctioned lists or um, aren't um, uh, uh, doing anything um, uh, in terms of changing behaviors or activities. And then ultimately, they have a challenge as it relates to investigations. And, and we view those as kind of the big three challenges that, uh, that our clients face. And in response to those uh, big three challenges, we knew that we needed a trinity uh, of, of services um, or capabilities, rather, to kind of mirror that. And those are advisory, uh, tell us how to, to, to fix the problem. Technology, um, how can we use technology to actually identify more bad guys and, and effectuate some of the, the policy issues that, that happen? And then ultimately people, um, somebody's got to execute uh, on this and that's where our, our track record had been. And so what we saw was a real opportunity as the company continued to kind of grow and expand uh, market share um, to really double down on the notion of technology. Um, to make those big three challenges a bit more frictionless, um, a bit more automated, and uh, a bit more seamless to, to catch more bad guys. And, and ultimately, I know for a, for a services organization, it might sound a little counterintuitive to provide your clients with something that will limit the number of people 
uh, needed to do the job. But, but here's what I'd say. One, doing the right thing is never wrong, right? Uh, it, it's always important to, to recognize what the mission of our company is. And the mission of our company is to fight financial crime for our clients and for the world. And if you truly believe in that mission, then you should embrace technology as part of that solution, even though it might limit the, the number of human beings you have working on a particular client or particular issue. So doing the right thing is never wrong. Uh, two, we really believe in the mission of, of what we're trying to do. And three, you know, we see our ability to, to couple really great technology and cutting end technology with really great human capital and actually gain more share uh, as a result. So, you know, for our, our, our viewers, you know, we were, you know, kind of seeing that, that banks and non-banks are on this journey anyway. So why not help them? Why not beat them to it and, and, and help them fix the problem? Well, and it seems that, you know, from at least my vantage point, it, it isn't limiting your human capital. Um, you expanded here in, I think, was it March 2019 here to Buffalo? Uh, thereabouts, yeah. Yeah. So um, at the time you committed, and I think everybody knew you were kind of going to blow past this, but committed to 100 jobs within your first five years. Uh, tell us where you're at now just so people understand kind of the scale at which, or, you know, like the rapid pace at which you've scaled. Yeah. Um, you know, we, uh, I guess you could call it a little bit of sandbagging, but you know, we, um, we, we wanted to set a bogey that we knew we felt comfortable about hitting it. So as we sit here today, we're at, at roughly 125, uh, 125 heads. We likely would have accelerated our growth in Buffalo even further, uh, but we had run out of space. And, and so um, through some, some great networking with, with uh, Bill Maggio, Sam Russo, uh, I was able to get connected with Douglas Jamal, and um, and we worked out um, you know a deal to to get in into Seneca One, um, which will expand our our footprint to uh, about 175 here in Buffalo, and we're fairly confident within the next six to eight months um, that we'll again be be at capacity at 175 uh, uh, people here in 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 Western New York. Um, candidly, you know we'd like to double that, and and so you know we're we're looking at um, you know opportunities to bring more technology jobs here. Uh, through some inorganic growth that, that we've done, some acquisition activity that we've done over the last six months. Um, there's certainly going to be a, a groundswell of technology jobs that we bring to Buffalo, as well as our, our core uh, services offerings. But we've also hired a, a whole host of um, uh, senior executives um, from the company that are now now based here as well. So we, we still look at Buffalo as a very uh, fertile growth ground for us and are doubling down and hopefully tripling down on, on what we do. So what about the you know, workforce or just business climate here in Buffalo, you know, maybe it's even those acquisitions that you kind of referred to that, you know, led to and validated the decision to keep reinvesting in Buffalo and expand here. You know, you have multiple other locations across the country and I think into Canada. So, you know, why Buffalo for this continued growth once you kind of hit your max um, at the previous office space in Larkin to kind of continue down that path? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, when we met the first time, you know, I told you that, you know, basically our, our theory of the case was we studied Buffalo amongst a handful of other kind of renaissance cities, I, I guess I'd say. And, and what we found was it met all of our criteria, um, but it also had this kind of extra. And the extra was kind of the, the grittiness, the work ethic, um, the, the stick to itness that, that you'd love to see from a, from a workforce and from a community. Um, and, and, and obviously the, the ability for the state, um, to get aggressive, you know, as it relates to, you know, certain tax incentives that, you know, we've been able to live up to our, our end of the bargain as well. And so when we put all those things together, Buffalo really made sense as a theory. Um, and then what we found in our workforce was that the theory, you know, came to fruition that we have really hardworking people that we've got access to really smart people. That you know, amongst the entire company, our attrition rates are the lowest uh, in, in in Buffalo, um, and so you know, why not double down here? You know, the quality of the work has been really high. The quality of the candidates has been really high. The the uh, I'd say the uh, business community uh, and ecosystem has been more than than supportive um, of of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to build here. And you know, when you put all those things together, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a no brainer to continue to grow your company in a place like this. And I was talking to somebody on your HR team recently, and you know, I know kind of when you came and when we first talked, a lot of your kind of hiring strategies to get to the scale so quickly was, you know, kind of targeting the colleges and universities 
um, entry level talent and the philosophy that you can, you know, train anybody to be an analyst, any, you know, critical thinker. And on our first podcast, you had um, told a great anecdote that one of your best analysts at the time was a gender studies major, I think it was. Um, yeah. So in talking to somebody on your team, you know, it was kind of revealed like you were, you know, that side of your talent pipeline was strong and that was validated kind of your theory of the case, but you were also surprised by the tech talent that you could attract here and even higher level talent, whether attracting them to Buffalo or hiring, you know, from here. So as you kind of continue to bring on that tech side of the business, um, is that one of the additional reasons why, you know, Buffalo kind of maybe surprised you in that extra that you mentioned out of the the business case when comparing to Renaissance cities? Yeah. And it's not just tech. I mean, so, you know, we're, we're very confident in our ability to scale technology jobs here and we're going to do that. Um, you know, we'll, uh, we've acquired uh, we acquired a company called Arachnus out of the UK. That's one of the leading providers of, of know your customer uh, data enrichment and watchlist filtering. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, we're going to make a huge investment uh, to to scale, you know, that product, that business. Um, we've acquired another company out of out of Germany called Pascon um, that has uh, 10, 11 offices and about 400 employees around the globe. Um, that has some interesting um, workflow and know your customer technology as well. Um, next week, we'll be announcing the acquisition of a, a tech-enabled third-party risk management and anti-bribery and corruption uh, business that serves large corporate clients. Um, and you know that's uh, a, another tech enabler. They're based in Hong Kong with with offices in in, in Vancouver, Penang, in, in Delhi. Um, and then we'll be announcing, hopefully by the end of July, uh, another technology, a U.S.-based technology company um, that um, you know we're hopeful will will us, you know, that product will will uh, expand and scale. So, so not just the technology jobs, we think we can do that. But what we found is a great experienced pool of talent here too. And so um, it's not just the entry level um, that that we're going after uh, in Buffalo. It's kind of what we would call maybe our seniors our senior analysts and investigators, as well as our team leads and QA and quality assurance folks. Um, this, the, the bench is, is really, really deep here. And the talent pool is, is, is much wider than, than we had actually anticipated, which is a great, you know, like a great surprise. So um, it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's really worked out. It makes me look kind of, kind of smart, right? Because I was, you know, nobody really was there. People are like, oh, Buffalo, right? Oh, sure. Um, but, uh, you know, but I kind of, I, I kind of knew what we were going to find here. And, and I'm, I'm pretty proud that we, uh, that we pulled it off and that Buffalo has delivered and done its part too. So you mentioned you're growing, expanding into Seneca One Tower. Uh, obviously, I think that building means a lot to Buffalo's resurgence and, Renaissance, you know, being the tallest skyscraper, you know, in the skyline, long empty and now kind of rejuvenated with all this energy. Um, you know, one, what does it mean to you just as a, you know, kind of newer company to Buffalo to be a part of that? And then um, two, I believe maybe in your first stint, did you work out of that building? So to kind of yeah, be back you know, as a... Uh, it's crazy, man. So I, my first job out of undergrad um, was, you know, 2002. Um, and I, um, I got into this, um, I think it was called like the North American Leadership Development Program at, at HSBC, um, based in Buffalo, but you got to travel to like London and Chicago and, and, and do a bunch of cool stuff. And, um, and, you know, my first days um, and first years as a like professional outside of undergrad. And I think I might even had like frosted tips back then. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's scary as that is and probably like some ill-fitted suit. And I, um, I was working, you know, on the 20, I think the 24th floor uh, of that building. And that's where everything started. And you know, that's where, that's where my, my professional life and career started. And so it's, uh, it's super humbling, to be honest, to, to have the opportunity to, to come back and build my own company um, in that building. And um, it means a lot. It really means a lot. So obviously, the last 15 months of the pandemic have had a lot of challenges. I'm curious, AML specifically is all about, um, you know, security and sure. data security. So how was that transition leading through a pandemic and you know, work from home remote policies, because I know in the office, you know, 
even in an office setting, that's a big concern. So how about when people kind of had to maybe go work from their living room? Yeah, you know, what I tell you is that the company didn't miss a beat. And, 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 and that's not anything I did. You know, we have a fantastic uh, IT and risk department led by a guy named Bill Murray, not the actual Bill Murray. Uh, he's our Bill Murray. Uh, we have uh, really great operations folks. Um, and, and really, you know, we, we, you know, we've grown from, you know, in 2014, we're about 30 or 40 people to nearly, I think we're over 2000 people in 13 different countries now. And, and we, but we've maintained that kind of entrepreneurial, uh, spirit. And so we take every problem and every challenge head on and aren't afraid to pivot and haven't gotten too bureaucratic, um, and so what it allowed us to do was kind of have really open and honest conversations with our clients, have open and honest conversations with our people, put together a roadmap and a plan. And I think within 15 business days, we had, you know, at the time, I think we were maybe 1,300 people. Um, we had 1,300 offices, right, <laughs> you know, where people were working from home. And it was about sitting down and, and building a control environment that made sense uh, from an IT and risk and infrastructure perspective. And, and while that's all happened, you know, thankfully we haven't had any, you know, kind of in incidences and we have a whole host of, you know, IT, you know, physical and logical and audit controls um, to make sure that, you know, data security and data privacy are the utmost concern. But um, we've also seen obviously a shift in the world, right? Where, where remote work and hybrid work and, and all that type of stuff is, is a bit more um, uh, uh, the flavor of the day. And, and quite frankly, I think now that clients are, are kind of, uh, indoctrinating that as, as, as the status quo, um, it's made it a little bit easier for us to, to kind of navigate those waters. You know, personally, I want everybody in our fabulous offices, especially Seneca One. Um, we're super excited about it, um, but we'll be methodical and, um, you know, we'll follow, um, we'll follow what our clients want. We'll follow what our people want. Um, we'll follow what's right, um, but we will, you know, start to bring people back um, at an appropriate time. And, and uh, we're looking forward to that too. I'm looking forward to getting in your Seneca One office too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> there's a wine uh, fridge. There, there's, I probably maybe I shouldn't say that on the podcast, but uh, <laughs> it was a one splurge. There's a, you know, yeah. There's a Tell me that off, Mike. I'll yeah, be there. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the last time you were on the podcast, we already ran you through the the Blizzard round, uh, you know, gauntlet. So I'll I'll spare you that from that this time. Um, we'll just end on kind of an open ended question. Obviously, a lot of energy here in Buffalo. Um, you know, you're a big believer in Buffalo and a big reason why others should believe in Buffalo because of your success. So what makes you optimistic about Western New York's future? Momentum, you know, um, you know, the you know, I, I look at what a guy like uh, Douglas uh, Jamal has, has meant for, for the city and. Um, and uh, I look at, you know, companies like, uh, like ours or Odoo or, uh, or even M&T and, and, and the, the, um, just the unabashed, you know, belief in what we can accomplish. And, and even through a pandemic to see all the cranes and the booms, you know, still around town doing their thing, there's just this unstoppable momentum, you know, right now. And, and I think um, what you're starting to see, and, and maybe some of this is, um, you know, it's like funny because you know, even the bills are playing well, right? You know, but it, it really feels like we're, we're on all cylinders and, and, and maybe that's a, a metaphor or, an, you know, for, for where the city's going is that we kind of believe in our team. You know, they're actually delivering. And I think kind of the same thing for us as a community. We believe in ourselves. We believe in our community. And we're actually seeing the results on the field now. And we're seeing economic development and we're seeing outside money come in, um, which is huge. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, for, you know, it's fantastic work by, by M&T and, and what they're looking to do to, you know, the tech hub and bring, you know, a thousand or so or, or more tech jobs to, to the area. Um, but, but it's outside companies coming in and, and really building a, a huge ecosystem. You're, you know, you're, you continue to see, you know, uh, 43 North and, and the other, you know, kind of upstart companies, um, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a Veravend or, or others, um, you know, started to really catch fire at the kind of the grassroots startup level. You're seeing big companies make investments and it's exciting. And, and so, you know, I think that momentum, you know, once you, uh, you know, motion, an object in motion stays in motion type of thing. Um, I think that's where we're at. And, and I don't, I don't really see it stopping. So, you know, I, I do think that it's incumbent on, um, 
you know, business owners and, and, and entrepreneurs to, to continue to, to reinvest and, and believe in the mission and, until it's done. And it's not done until it's done. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the, while the pandemic was certainly, you know, a, a bump in the night, you know, maybe that's an understatement to call it a bump in the night. Um, but I think it is. And I think when we look back, you know, we're, we're going to evaluate it and we're going to say, you know, it was a, a good test of our metal, but it didn't stop our momentum. And, and that's, that's kind of the message that I would have. Great answer. We're lucky to have you and AML on our team. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it, man. Bell Ringer is a podcast by Invest Buffalo Niagara, the region's privately funded nonprofit marketing and economic development organization. Please rate this podcast, follow our social media channels, and read our blog at buffaloniagara.org for the best of Buffalo Niagara. Come grow your business with us.